Okay, I think we're ready to begin. Well, good morning, everyone. My name is John Issel, Deputy Director for Montgomery Parks, and I wanna thank you for joining us today. We are so thrilled to be welcoming, welcoming back Gil Penalosa to our Park Speaker Series to discuss a very important topic, which is ensuring older adults live happier and healthier lives and how parks can support that goal. We are pleased to welcome Jennifer Holes, Associate Director of the Outreach for AARP Maryland, who will also be sharing information on AARP's age-friendly initiative. However, before we begin, I need to run through a few quick housekeeping rules. First, we are recording this presentation and we'll be providing a link so you can refer back to any information that is presented. So if you missed something, you can always go back. Second, I wanna direct your attention to the Q&A box. Uh, this is where you can submit your questions or comments at any time and we will address as many as we can at the end of the presentation. Uh, next, for those of you who are pursuing continuing education credits through the American Planning Association's Professional Institute or the Landscape Architect Continuing Education System, please click, click on the sign in link so we have a recording of your attendance today. Uh, for, those of, for those who may be joining us for the first time, I'd like to provide a brief introduction to our agency. We are located in Montgomery County, Maryland, a suburb of Washington, DC, and we are part of the Maryland National Capital Park and Planning Commission a bi-county agency that also includes our neighbor, Prince George's County. We are the proud recipients of six national gold medals for parks and recreation management. Our park system consists of 424 parks, over 37,000 acres, which is about 10% of the land mass in Montgomery County. Now let's get to today's topic. The good news is that life expectancy continues to increase around the world and we can all hope to spend a full one third of our lives post 60 years old. This is great news. Parks in particular provide many health, wellness, and socialization opportunities, yet one study found that only 4% of park users in the US are over the age of 60. How can we ensure the needs of older adults are prioritized in parks and cities? We're gonna find out today. First, I'm gonna turn it over to Jennifer Holes to share information into the work of AARP Maryland and what they're doing locally, and then we will hear from Gil. But first, I wanna talk a little bit about Gil. Gil is the founder and chair of the internationally recognized nonprofit organization, 880 Cities, as well as the first ambassador of World Urban Parks. Gil is passionate about creating vibrant and healthy cities for all people. Throughout his career, Gil has been a strong advocate for improving city parks making his first mark in Bogota, Colombia, where he led the design and construction of over 200 parks and initiated a successful open streets program that sees over 1.3 million people walk, run, skate, and bike along Bogota's city roads every Sunday of the year. Gil has been invited to work in over 350 sites around the globe, and we are very fortunate to have him join us today. Um, so with that, I'd like to turn it over to Jennifer Holes. Uh, Casey Anderson, are you on today? If Casey Anderson's there, you can we'll invite you to say a few words. I'm not sure if you're there. Okay, so he's not here. So um, Jennifer, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you so much, John. Thank you. So again, my name is Jen Holtz. I am one of the Associate State Directors for Outreach at the AARP Maryland office. And if you've not heard of us before, um, the state offices at AARP are basically the local boots on the ground conducting all of the outreach and advocacy relevant to the folks in that state. And so I'm going to give you a brief rundown of the age-friendly eight domains of livability and talk a little bit about what Montgomery County is actually doing um, right here locally. And I also wanna say I am absolutely honored to be conducting this presentation along with Gil. He was my personal inspiration for a big parks project in Baltimore back in 2017. And I think you're really gonna enjoy hearing from him. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and hope that it works. How are we looking guys? 
Good? Okay. Fantastic. All right, thank you very much. So I'm gonna stop my video because it does help with my connectivity. So AARP Livable Communities supports the efforts of neighborhoods, towns, cities, and rural areas to be great places for people of all ages. We believe that communities should provide safe, walkable streets, age-friendly housing and transportation options, and access to needed services, as well as opportunities for residents of all ages to participate in community life. I'm gonna to briefly touch on the eight domains of livability and point out some of the excellent work being done right here in Montgomery County. Then I'll pass it along to Gil to discuss the nitty gritty around why this work is so incredibly important and how we can certainly do more. So let's start with outdoor spaces and buildings. People need public places to gather, indoors and out, green spaces, seating and accessible buildings, elevators, zero step entrances, staircases with railings. These can all be used and enjoyed by people of all ages. Next is transportation. Driving should not be the only way to get around. Pedestrians, they need safe sidewalks, crossable streets. Dedicated bicycle lanes benefit both non-drivers and drivers alike. Public transit options can range from the large scale like trains, buses, light rail, to the small, taxis, shuttles, or rideshare services. And then there's housing. AARP surveys consistently find that the vast majority of older adults want to reside in their current home or community for as long as possible. Doing so is possible if a home is designed or modified for aging in place or if a community has housing options that are suitable for differing incomes, ages, and life stages. And then there's social, social participation. Regardless of a person's age, loneliness is often as debilitating as a health condition, um, just as having a chronic illness or disease. Sadness and isolation can be com combated by having opportunities to socialize, and the availability of accessible, affordable, and fun social activities. Number five is respect and social inclusion. Everyone wants to feel valued. Intergenerational gatherings and activities are a great, great way for young people and older people to learn from one another, to honor what each has to offer, at the same time to feel good about themselves. And then work and civic engagement. Why does work need to be an all or nothing experience? An age-friendly community encourages older people to be actively engaged in community life and has opportunities for residents to work for pay or volunteer their skills. And number seven is communication and information. We now communicate in ways few could have, ima could have imagined a decade ago. Age-friendly communities recognize that information needs to be shared through a variety of methods since not everyone is tech savvy and not everyone has a smartphone or home-based access to the internet. And finally, community and health services. At some point, every person of every age gets hurt, becomes ill, or simply needs some help. While it's important that assistance and care can be available nearby, it's essential that residents are able to access and afford the services they require. So with that, I want to share with you the great work being done for Montgomery County's age-friendly communities effort. Montgomery County actually enrolled in the age-friendly effort in 2015. They've been working toward a more inclusive and livable community for all ages for several years now. And they actually chose to proceed with 10 domains instead of eight because they are overachievers by adding elder safety and separating the work and civic engagement into separate domains. So here are some great initiatives happening right here in Montgomery, to, uh, in Montgomery County today. The Montgomery County Home Sharing Program is an innovative idea. Homeowners 
offer uh, spare rooms or accessory dwelling units in their home for rent um, for people who are searching for affordable, healthy, and safe housing. Home sharing can actually reduce social isolation, create monthly income for homeowners, and offer new affordable housing options for home seekers. It's managed by the Housing Initiative Partnership and supported by Montgomery County's Department of Health and Human Services. The program offers free access to the SilverNest online platform, which provides background checks, lease creators, and home, and home sharing in, uh, insurance. We've also got the Crimes Against Seniors and Vulnerable Adults Unit. The Montgomery County State's Attorney's Office began a specialized unit. This supports and protects the growing number of seniors and vulnerable adults in your community from physical abuse, neglect, sexual abuse, financial exploitation, etc. They specialize in investigating and prosecuting cases of physical abuse um, and all, site, all sorts of abuse. They focus on community outreach. They believe that education is the key to preventing our residents from being victimized. You've also got the Mobile Integrated Health Program to reduce the impact of users of 911. So this is being done by the Montgomery County Fire and Rescue Services Mobile Integrated Health Initiative. And it aligns strategically with the community partners, hospitals, senior living facilities, and they connect high, high utilizers of 911 with safety net services. It ultimately reduces their interactions with emergency medical services. And of course, the Montgomery County Parks Department, creating accessible parks. They've added multi-generational fitness equipment to all playgrounds and the playground renovation program. They've moved more than 1,400 barriers in county parks. They've added a specialist to coordinate programs and events throughout the park system that are inclusive and welcoming of all residents. Frankly, I could go on and on with the successes that Montgomery County has had in ensuring that they are working every day to make Montgomery County livable for all ages. But with that, I don't wanna take up too much of Gil's time. If you wanna learn more about what AARP and your community is doing um, in the realm of livable communities, please feel free to visit any one of these websites and you are also more than welcome to reach out to me at AARP at any time. And I will pass it along to Gil. Thanks, Jennifer. It's a really very important word. AARP and the Montgomery County age-friendly group are doing. I wanna I wanna share my screen. Okay. So today I, I want to speak about parks and recreation and older adults. How can parks and recreation contribute to making older adults live longer, but healthier and happier everywhere? 39.7. That's the life expectancy increase in the US in the last 150 years. This is incredible. If we had been born over 150 years ago, the life expectancy would be almost 40 years less than what it is today. So many of us on the call would be dead by now. 20.9 is the life expectancy increase in the last 100 years. I mean, this is really amazing. I think that this is even more incredible than even putting a man on the moon. Imagine we've been around for over 200,000 years. And in 200,000 years, up until 150 years ago, so like in 1871, the life expectancy was 39. Today, it's been double, double in the last 150 years. This is something so good in so many ways, also because most of this are healthy years. And this is great. Some people say, oh yeah, but people are, are, get very dependent and sick towards the end of their life. Yeah, 
People usually are very dependent in the last two or three years if they are going to live to 90 in the last two or three years. If they're going to live to 80 in the last two or three years. If they're going to live to 60 in the last two or three years. So the increase has been mostly healthy years. But why is it that there is such a negative perception? I find I, 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 I work in more than 350 different cities and almost everywhere, the mayors and councilors and staff and citizens, oh, Gil, we have a problem. I said, yeah, what is the problem? Oh, we have too many old people. I said, what? Why is that a negative? What is that a problem? The reality is that our bodies age. So since we are born, we start aging, but our minds, our spirit is still alive. I think we, we should remember Almost every day in parks and recreation, the George Bernard Shaw quote, we don't stop, we don't stop playing because we go old. No, we go old because we stop playing. So it's so common to hear about the great tsunami, uh, you know, everything. And the reality is that if we view aging as decline, it ends up becoming a self-fulfilling prophecy. So we need to change our mindsets. We need to end ageism. Ageism is discrimination by age, any age. You cannot do this because you are a child or you cannot talk about politics because you are too young or you cannot work because you are too old. Uh, it's, you know, ageism is, is really horrible. And by the way, the happiness, when you look at Google, when you Google, the happiness curve, you will find out that the happiness time in our lives are when we are children and when we're older. Uh, unfortunately, I tell my children that are in their 30s that, yeah, they suffer because they are not going to be able to get, buy a house and they are finding jobs and they're transitioning and you getting kids and so on. So middle age is, is more confusing. It's also challenging, but confusing. And people are concerned that in Parks and Rec, the other, the other day someone, a director of Parks told me, oh yeah, we have programs over Alzheimer. No, less than 10% of the people get Alzheimer. The other 90% actually get anxiety of Alzheimer. We forget someone's name and we say, oh my God, I'm getting it. We forget the keys. No, everybody forgets. Everybody forgets at all times. That's, that, that's not the older people. I mean, ageism is dumb. Ageism is dumb. And sometimes ageism, even if not intended, we put up these dumb signs that is like reminding people all the time, senior people are weak, senior people are fragile. No, the overwhelming majority of seniors do not need any mobility issues. Uh, but everybody with disabilities do need special conditions, regardless if you are 80 or 60 or 40 or 10 years old. So we need to stop ageism. Ageism is prejudiced against our own children. Pre ageism is prejudiced against our parents, our own future selves. So the reality is that aging is not a problem to solve or a disease to cure. Aging is living, is living. So we need to fight ageism because that is part of the problem that we have with parks and rec and, and, and how older people are using parks. <clears throat> so let's end, no more too old for anything, too young for anything. Ageism doesn't make any sense. Also, there is so much blame going around on olders for everything bad that is happening. And this blaming game really doesn't solve any issue. And when people blame olders for everything, also they forget that, for example, 30 years ago, 4 billion people had clean water. Today, over 7 billion people have clean water. So there's a lot of things that boomers and olders ha have done right. I mean, the, the worst population living in poverty 40 years ago, it was more than 4 out of 10 were in extreme poverty. Today, it's less than 1 out of 10, even with a much larger population. The death of children is decreasing almost on everything is decreasing, huge. And with fewer children dying and people living older, then of course the life expectancy has increased. Half of the increase is due to fewer children dying and about half of the increase is because we are living longer. 
And this is exciting. By the way, it's not just in Montgomery County. It's all over the world. Look at this graph. 200 years ago, all of the dots are the countries of the world. 200 years ago, we didn't have any country with a life expectancy above 45, including the US. Today, we don't have any country with a life expectancy below 45. This is really amazing. And how the demography is changing, like the, the current population pyramid here is on green. And it's gonna be moving towards the yellow. The over six is gonna continue to grow. And we're living longer, not longer, much, much longer. It's what I call the new 60. Can you imagine the people in the history of humanity, the people that have ever lived to 60, half are alive today, half. The, and the, popular, the people over 60 today in the world, we got about 962 million. In 30 years, which is nothing, we're gonna go to 2.1 billion. It's gonna more than double. And people are happy, people are enjoying their gardens and eating ice cream and playing with their grandchildren in the parks. And in the US, the older people are injecting over 7 trillion into the economy every year. If it was a separate country, the over 60 would be the third largest economy. And by the way, the over 60 in the US and in Montgomery County is gonna double. The over 80 is gonna quadruple. So we gotta think of our third act. This is, I think we should create this movement of our third act where older are gonna live healthier and happier. And life is kind of like in three acts. One act is since we are born here our twenties when we are dependent uh, from babies and then we go to school and then we're learning and we're being educated. Our second act is that adults from the twenties to the late fifties. Then we work, also we might have children or we might have a partner or whatever. That's our life as adults. And the third act is from the late fifties, early sixties till the end of life. And that third act, that third act is the one, is a full third of our lives. There's nothing insignificant. Sometimes we don't even pay attention to it, the parks and wrecks in many parts around the world, but it's a full third of our lives. And of course, we need to take care of the people that are very dependent. That's very, very important, both indoors and outdoors and parks and recreation has to be a major part of it. But because the last three or five years, usually everyone becomes very dependent. That's about 15% 15, 15 of our life as older adults. But 25 years, we're pretty independent. That's 85% of our life as older adults. And you know, part of the ageism is that with COVID, for example, with COVID, many of the people that died in Canada, where I live in Toronto, it's horrible. In Canada, over 80% of the people that died has been in long-term care homes because they were very poorly managed and, and horrible ageism. If that was happening with children, the government and everybody should have done something different. Those are the, these people, the 15% in the last three or five years of their lives. And, and, and that ageism becomes, we gotta work on both the dependence as well as the independence. Each one, both dependence and independence must live healthier and happier than what we live today. And that's part of the goal of our third act, living older, healthier, and happier. And what is the role of parks and recreation in this? What is the role of parks? Think of it, of, of your, the parks and recreation in Montgomery County or in your city or wherever you are connecting. We have people connecting from England, from Kenya, from Chile, from everywhere. What is the role of parks and rec? Older people are hungry, but of, they want of game time, of playing. The life expectancy in the US has doubled in the last 150 years. So in many ways we learn how to survive, but when we still have issues of equity, climate change, public health crisis, it's very clear that we need to learn how to live and learning how to live parks has a huge role. Let's put things into context. Today, we have about 3.5 billion people living in cities around within the lifetime of our students, we're gonna double to 7 billion people. And you know, it could be very civilized, people walking and cycling, they using sustainable mobility. 
all people enjoying parks. This is how it could be. I mean, the U.S., the population is going to increase in the next 40 years between 80 and 100 million. The U.S. is going to have built over 50 million homes, also because people are moving from some cities to other cities. 50 million homes, to put it into context, is the same as all of the homes that exist in Canada, France, and Australia together. So the U.S., what a wonderful opportunity, but what a huge responsibility. How is this going to be done? Montgomery County is growing as well. The population is going to increase by over 20% in the next 30 years, at least 20%. And people want to age in place. Almost 9 out of 10 people in all of the service in the U.S., they say that they want to age in place. People want to age in the same neighborhood. People want so 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 we need to do things differently. And of course, this includes also issues of mobility and sustainable mobility. And when we were thinking about these issues and climate change and the symptoms were everywhere, even if some people didn't want to believe in them, all of a sudden COVID-19 arrived. And some people say everything changed. I don't think much has changed. I think our perception has changed. It's like if we have gotten some magnifying glasses to look at our parks and our cities, and we've seen the what we thought was invisible became visible. All of a sudden, we saw homeless people with over 80% of the hotels empty, and we saw people sleeping in the parks, in the parking lots, in the sidewalks. So wh where is the equity? Where is the equity? At the same time, with fewer cars on the streets, we saw that the air became a lot cleaner. So do we wanna go back to this or do we wanna change into this? It's, a, it's about how do we wanna live? I think the post COVID in Montgomery County and everywhere has to be around health, equity, sustainability. And when I'm talking about health, I'm talking about the state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, as said by the World Health Organization, is not just the absence of disease. And when we're talking about sustainability, I'm talking about sustainable happiness. That is the happiness that contributes to the individual, the community, or the global well-being, but does not exploit other people, the environment, or future generations. And equity is giving everybody what they need to be successful. It's not the same as equality, giving everyone the same. Some people are starting so far behind that they need a lot more to be equitable. Then we can think about it. You know, it's like someone did this cartoon that is very clear. This is equality. No, some people are starting so far behind that they might need two and three boxes. Others might not need any box. So someone said, oh, if that's equity and, and equality, this is reality. Things are getting worse. But in Montgomery County, let's think outside the box. Maybe it's taking down walls, what we should be doing. So we must ensure equity before actually we can have equality. So how do you want Montgomery County to become? I think the post covid also shows an opportunity, not only to be equitable and sustainable, but where older people will live healthier and happier. And I've done research on Montgomery County. Also, I, I live there. By the way, I graduated from high school. And one of my brothers as well, from what I did from uh, Winston Churchill, uh, another brother from Churchill as well, and, and the older one from uh, Whitman. And actually now the aerial photos of Whitman show that the parking lot is bigger than the classrooms. It, it, that, that, that's not very sustainable mobility. And by the way, maybe he got something good in the county because then he became mayor twice. And also I was in, 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 impacted by things that I now work in more than 350 different cities around the world. Of course, Montgomery County has changed tremendously since then. But there are some things still very much about car, car, car. About seven out of 10 trips are done by car. Also, we see that a lot, most of the people live and work in Montgomery County, six out of 10 people. Also, we see that more than a third, 37% have household has less than 50,000 income. The Blacks and the Hispanic have even less. Foreign born citizens, lots. It was only 12%, 12 out of 100 in 1980. 40 years later, now it's 33%. But thinking of the older adults, the population over 65, population over 65 in Montgomery County, in 1960 was one out of 20. Today is one out of six. 
and soon in 20 years it's going to be one in five so the population over 65 has grown a lot but it's going to continue growing a lot and this is good news so we, let's keep health equity and sustainability and from a horrible situation also there can be opportunities i mean there were not enough parks in the world we needed to be outside in the fresh air physically active socially connected but physically separated so people closed down streets they opened streets to people and closed them to cars and they were like all of a sudden they created these parks in oakland california they did 72 miles in 24 hours and the mayor says that now 90 percent of those are gonna stay imagine all the streets in the neighborhoods, nor the arterials, the arterials, no, but in the neighbors is only for the local traffic and less than 10 miles an hour. So it's for people, all their adults to come out and play and children and people in wheelchairs and everyone. Imagine less noise, better quality of air, safer. So this is, this is something that is not about COVID. COVID showed us that it's possible. With fewer cars, we saw all over the world how people started creating protected bike lanes, networks, things that people thought that it was going to take decades or years. All of a sudden, it took weeks. And within weeks, all of this connectivity was done. So it showed that it's possible. It's not a technical issue. It's not a financial issue. We saw that dedicated lanes for buses overnight they were popping up all over the place so that people would connect uh, on public transit that was fast and efficient markets on the streets so this is really incredible in san francisco golf courses overnight in 24 hours turning into parks so instead of having a golf course where 250 people can play maximum maximum in one day now you have parts where thousands and thousands and thousands of people could play. This is about equity. It doesn't really make any sense that in cities where there are issues of housing or parks, that you have golf, public golf courses or even private heavily subsidized. So the impossible, all of a sudden, it's impossible. And people are happy that this could be done. So in out of something horrible, some positive signs came. So in many ways, there is an opportunity. And some people are saying, oh, you know, we're going to change. This is, seems easy. And we're going to be do, doing linear parks wherever there were roads. Uh, unfortunately, it's not going to be that easy. There's many people that are thinking the other way. They are thinking of being more isolated, more car oriented, more independent and not community minded. So everybody who loves parks, we need to be very loud and clear. We need to be advocates. So how can Parks and Rec help us live longer, healthier, happier? And now I'm very much in, in, in touch with older because now I'm over 60. Also now I have one grandchild that is the love of my life. And I've enjoyed parks all my life. Uh, I'm the founder and chair of 880 Cities. And 880 Cities is really not about parks or streets or walking. Those are the means, not the end. The end is, how can we help create successful cities? And I love to see where I was going to be speaking before it was virtual. Here, I went to see this plaza. And they say, how am I going to compete with these people dancing? I was going to speak there the next day. And then I saw the DJ, DJ Vika. Yes, we're living longer. She's a businesswoman. She goes from park to park, organizing dances. So this is the idea of 880 cities, uh, healthier communities, happier people. And always people say, oh, can my grandparents ride their bike to get eggs or milk? Uh, can my children walk to school? Can my great-great-grandparents great walk to the park? Look, you don't need to be an engineer. The edited rule of common sense, but common sense is to be the least common of the senses. Three steps. Step number one, think of a child that you love around eight years old. Once you have that child, step number two, think of an 80 year old that you love, your parents, your grandparents, your brothers, your sisters. And once you have the child and the older adult, step number three, would you send them walking to the park across the crosswalk? Uh, would you send them to school or to get eggs or milk? If you would, it's because it's safe enough, but you would not, it's because it's not, and we gotta do it different. What if everything that you did in Montgomery County, everything, the sidewalk, the crosswalk, the park, 
the libraries, the schools, the businesses, everything had to be great for an eight and an 80. Not A2, A8, and 80 as an indicator species. Because if it's good for the 8 and the 80, it's going to be good for everybody from zero to over 100. We need to stop building cities and see everybody is 30 year old and athletic and create great cities for all. That is the concept of 880 cities. And the nice thing is that everything that is good for older people is good for everyone. If we do a crosswalk that is good for older, it's going to be good for everybody. So let's focus now, that was one third of the presentation. The other two thirds, I'm gonna focus on five actions for well-being, and 12 must have for parks. And before I go into the five actions, I wanna congratulate the age-friendly program uh, in Montgomery County that they have, you have done a lot of good things. There is a very, uh, a very clear action plan, detailed topic by topic. And people can go to the website and see all of the progress. And Jennifer spoke about it. So it's really good. It was born out of the World Health Organization. They said, how can we create age-friendly communities? An AARP that has 38 million members in the US, AARP, has adopted this and has transformed it. And now more than 500 cities and now some states in the US have adopted age-friendly communities. And these are the eight domains that very well Jennifer explains, so I'm not going to go through them. Just to tell you that parks and rec directly or indirectly have to do with all of them, with all of them. Uh, so now let me take you through the uh, five actions of, of well-being. Something that is really interesting is that uh, when we think of the, of the eight domains, of course, parks and rec has to do uh, with mobility, because if we don't have parks, we're going to have to drive all over the place. Uh, parks and rec also have with health and with housing uh, and also with sociability. So this is, we, parks and rec is really about lots of things. It's, it's pretty much about everything that we need about living. So let me take you through the five domains. Uh, oh, what happened here? Sorry, I, I wanted you to have a rest from, from looking at slides. Okay, these are the five actions for well-being. Uh, let me take you through them. Um, and when we're thinking of happier and healthier, uh, something, let's keep in mind this, 30% of living longer, healthier and happier are genetics and medical care. And there is nothing we can do about genetics and very little that we can do a medical care. That's more at the national level. Of course, everybody should have medical care. Everybody, everywhere. But the other 70% is about social, behavioral, and environmental. And at the end of the day, that's where parks and rec. Parks and rec can have a huge impact on that 70%, which defines how long we're going to live, how healthy and how happy. By the way, geriatric care in the US, 11, only 11 out of 141 medical schools have geriatric. Less than 1% of the nurses go into geriatric. Less than 4% of the social workers. Uh, in the US, there are 7,000 geriatricians. There's only one for every 2,000 people over 70 one for every 2,000 people over 70. And let's keep in mind that over 10,000 people are turning 65 every day. 10,000 yesterday, 10,000 today, 10,000 tomorrow. So I guess we better focus on this. If we don't focus on the social, behavioral, environmental, it's gonna be very, very, you can have the best healthcare system in the world, but if we don't have promotion, if we don't become healthier, it's not gonna work. We need to recreate cities for older people. You know, it's like, there are some ingredients. Let's say you're gonna invite friends to your house. And uh, when you're gonna invite friends to your house, you got the food and then you got the salad. And if that's all you got, spiceless salad, people are not gonna like it. So then there are two options. Here you get great ingredients for a great salad and make it really delicious or your guests are gonna go to another place. Uh, so let's get the ingredients. I mean, if we improve the start, it's going to improve everything. That's like life as well. 
So we are going to end up with magnificent and delicious salad for everybody if we have the right ingredients. Uh, so let's keep in mind, if we improve the beginning, we're going to improve the life. Equitable and sustainable communities also have ingredients, healthier and happier. What are some of the ingredients? Is the well-being. What is well-being? Is being well. How to be well? Some people say, oh, the secrets of living longer. No, I don't think it's secrets. Don't worry about the secrets. I'm going to tell you five doable actions that anyone can do. Five doable actions. First one, eat more plant-based eat more plant-based. So parks, let's have farmers markets in the parks. Let's have urban gardening so that children and older adults will learn that the tomatoes don't come out of factory and the magic of grandparents and grandchildren growing things in the parks. I'm not asking you, I'm not asking everyone on the call to be vegetarian. No, 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 no. You don't have to become vegetarian, but let's think if half of us ate half as much meat as we currently do, the impact is the same as if half of us had become vegetarians. So more plant-based. Second, we need to sleep seven to eight hours. Everyone needs to sleep. Sometimes people say older people don't need, older people need the seven or eight hours. When older people sleep only five hours, then during the daytime, they don't remember things. When the 20 year old only sleeps five hours, also they, they forget things during the day. So we need to sleep. Of course, I'm conscious of homelessness and a place to live should be a human right everywhere. Uh, so homeless people, they must be welcome in the parks, especially older adults that are homeless should be welcome to the parks. But the parks are not the places where people live. I mean, people say, oh, let's put all of the tents in the park. Yeah, why don't we put them in the people's homes that say that? Or why don't we put them in front of city hall? Or why don't we put them in front of the schools? Who thinks that the place to put homeless is the parks? No, remember, even with 80% of the hotels empty. So yeah, we do need to sleep seven or eight hours, but also we need to be aware that everybody has to have a roof. So we need, to, this is about equity. Housing must be a human rights issue. Number three, we need to socialize, socialize. And the parks is magnificent places to socialize, to meet people, to go with friends, to do activities. This is quite fantastic. We can socialize everywhere. Some people think that it's cool to do knitting at home through the internet, but actually it's much more cool to do knitting in the park. Knitting in the park is really amazing. This knit and talk in Montana, because you know the knitting becomes kind of the excuse. It's like when the walking groups, the, the excuse is walking. The real thing is to socialize. Four, let's have contact with nature. Contact with nature is gonna help us for everything, for mental health, for physical health. And contact with nature is doable and we gotta have contact with nature everywhere. At home, uh, on the sidewalks, on the streets, on the parks. This is so important that the parks can do. If we have contact with nature, you know, it should not be difficult for anyone. We should have access to nature everywhere. And five, we need to be physically active, physically active. And physical activity is walking to the farmer's market in the parks. Physical activity, this basketball team in San Diego for only people over 80 years old. I mean, if we're active, it's gonna decrease the premature death, the strokes, many cancers, heart disease, high blood pressure, type two diabetes. I mean, all the others, it's only 30 minutes a day, but it has to be five days or more per week. So there is an urgency of being physically active. People are waiting for the magic pill. No, sorry, there is no magic pill. The only way that people in Montgomery County are gonna be physically active, the only way is if we walk and bike and play but as a normal part of everyday life. And parks and trails and recreation are the magnificent. It's like, like, like a parks prescription, better than the medical prescription. So let's keep in mind, 30 minutes, but every day. And even those 30 minutes don't have to be at the same time. You can go 15 minutes in the morning, 15 minutes in the afternoon. This is not about running marathons as a fantastic, a person that used to run here and he recently passed away. But even at 85, he ran marathons under four hours. No, you don't need to run marathons under four hours. It's just 30 minutes a day. So these are the five actions. Keep in mind, eat more plant-based, sleep seven to eight hours, have contact with nature, socialize, 
and do physical activity. 30 minutes, five or more days a week. And parks and rec have a lot to do with all of this. Parks and rec totally with nature, socialize and physical activity. Partially also with the eat more plant-based if we promote the farmers markets and the urban gardening. And at the end of the day, we do those four also we're gonna sleep better. So I was saying that this talk, the second part of the three parts was five actions of well-being. Now the last part is gonna be the 12 most haves in parks and olders. So what are the 12 most half? Uh, let me tell you a little bit about me and parks so, so that you get an idea why I'm talking about parks and older adults, not only because now, now I'm over 60, but I have loved parks all of my life. Like when I was a little kid, fortunately we live in front of a park and I used to spend all my Saturdays and Sundays and all my free time in the park. Then when I went to uh, UCLA to do uh, graduate work, uh, I visited parks all over the West Coast. And actually before that, my wife and I, we went for nine months over, we had never been to Europe. So we went like to 20 countries camping, 90% of the time camping. And I got to see so many magnificent campgrounds. But now I live in Canada, but before coming to Canada, I was commissioner in Bogota. And when I was commissioner working directly with the mayor, we designed and built over 200 parks all over the city, small ones, big ones. This was one of them. Uh, in the heart of the city, the Pope came, gave a mass for a million people, and then the Pope left and nothing happened in 27 years. Why nothing happened? Because change is hard in Montgomery County and everywhere, because you try to change and the cave people show up. Who are the cave? They are the citizens against virtually everything. But please don't accept no for an answer. We need to find solutions to the problem, not problems to the solutions. So nothing happened in 27 years and in four years we turned it into the nicest park for active, for passive, for contemplative recreation, for people of all ages, older adults and people to do all kinds of activities. So it's really, really great park and it continues to be one of the parks most used. But it wasn't just big parks, hundreds of small ones, especially in the poorest areas where you see there were not even paved, paved roads. But why is it that in the poor areas you need parks? And it's so critical because the poor people live in very small homes. And when you live in a, a 300 square foot home, you don't live there, you sleep. You live is outside. So the poor people need even better public space, better parks and better sidewalks and better bikeways and so on. So this was very, very interesting. And then, no, 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 no. I didn't do this New York Central Park, but this was my inspiration for the Ciclovia. What is this? I was reading Frederick Olmsted, the person who designed Central Park and built it and also built most of the best parks in North America. He said in New York, Everybody had was a conflict, blacks and whites, immigrants and locals, rich and poor. And he said, we need to create places where people can meet each other as equals. And I thought, you know, cities could, could do same as Central Park from the point of view of social integration and physical activity. And that's what the concept of the Ciclovia. It had existed for a couple of decades, but there was a very small program and was going down with a few thousand people. And we turned it into the world's largest pop-up park. This is like a temporary park, like a seven hour a week park. Every Sunday of the year, you open streets to people, you close into cars and the magic happens. The colors are the different income levels. It was only the upper income. I made sure that the poorest neighborhoods were connected 75 miles, interconnecting also access to all of the major parks of the city so that people can use this as a way to get to the parks. And some people walk, some people bike, some people run, people shop, people socialize, people do all kinds of activities. And it's something that is excellent. Uh, we get one out of four people coming out every Sunday of the year. This changes people's minds. All of a sudden, people realize that the streets are public space. They can have different uses according to the time of the day, the day of the week, the week of the year. And we should be doing this in every city. It works in cities of 10,000 people or 10 million people. It works equally well. This is about social integration. It's uh, about we're meeting each other as equals. That's why it is taking off uh, it's like a positive virus. Also about me and parks, World Urban Parks, I was chair during the last two terms. This is the world entity on parks and open spaces and recreation. I had to step down, uh, but they asked me to stay as first ambassador. What, what is this? World Urban Parks, we think that everybody should have access to good quality urban parks. 
and that is, is sharing and learning. And we have world congresses and we also have advocate committees and there is one on older adults and parks. And if you want more information, that is the website, worldurbanparks.org. And I hope Montgomery County and many other will become members. And also, th this is for in my office, uh, a board that I take in the cities where I have been. Uh, and I, I have visited parks, either working directly in the park or in activity somehow connected. In over 350 different cities, these are the, the countries in blue are the countries where I have, have the, I've been very, very lucky to have work. So now after telling you about my love affair with parks and my experience, let me take you through the 12 most halves. Because you know, the, in the US, the population over six is about 20% of the population, but it's only 4% of the park users, only 4%. So there is something we must do for, maybe we gotta work on the benefits. We gotta tell people if we have parks and recreation, why is this gonna be good for all of this? For culture and happiness and environment and economic development and community development. And there are some that is more related than others, but it touches everyone having good parks and recreation. So these are the 12 models. The first one, equity, equity. We must focus on equity. Uh, the priority of working on older adults is the vulnerable older adults. Everyone, older adults that are poor, that have disabilities, that come from a racial minority, an ethnic minority. So we gotta focus because a lot of the people, older adults are hurting. So we need to focus and engage them, bring them to the parks and help them out. You know, President Carter, what an amazing person. Three, four years ago, he spent two weeks building homes here in Canada, in Calgary. I mean, older adults, we are givers. We're not takers. Second message, 10, 20, 30. A campaign of Water Brand Park, the 10, 20, 30. What is 10, 20, 30? I mean, every older adult should have a park within 10 minutes. Uh, a quality park within a short walk. Every other adult should have it. Uh, let's keep in mind in the US, the wealthiest country in the world, 100 million people living in cities do not have a park within walking distance. That's one out of every three people. That doesn't make any sense. That needs to be solved. That needs to be solved. And when I'm talking about 10, 20, 30 means that everybody should have a park, a neighborhood park, at least a neighborhood park within a 10 minute walk and a bigger, more activity part within a 20 minute walk. And this has to be done now by 2030. Let's not say that it's in the long-term plan by 2050. No, we need it now by 2030. And this has a lot to do also with you. now during COVID, people are talking about the 15 minute city, having all of the services uh, within a 15 minute walk. Well, parks are a major part of this. Next, infrastructure infrastructure, we need to have, of course, walking paths and benches are critical. Walking paths, why walking paths? Because walking is the number one activity in any park, especially for older adults. But also we need game tables and restrooms and drinking fountains and trees and shade and plants and flowers and water. So we gotta have every single park of any size should have walking paths whether it's the size of a basketball court or is the size of a central park. Look, this is a small, in, front, in Singapore, I saw this in front of a library. They got the nice walking path around and it has the sign, uh, how, how, how much is each lap and how, how much is two laps and three and four and five. And people like to go either with their babies or by themselves or walking or running. And this is fantastic in Sheridan, North Carolina, how I saw that a not-for-profit was building uh, this this park. So this is something that is completely doable and benches, 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 benches. People like to sit either to read or to socialize or to chat or to talk politics. You will never have too many benches in the parks. It's almost impossible. So make sure you put benches everywhere. Next, the parks are about uses and activities. It's not, it's not only infrastructure. It's hardware, but it's also software. Uh, the uses and the activities. Of course, I mentioned walking, but people also want to do gardening and knitting and Tai Chi and chess and movies and celebrations and so on. So let's have activities, activities that people can come in and use. And, and it, it's something that the more activities, if you've got 10 or more things to do, you're going to come and do two or three and you are going to continue coming over and over because there are more things to do. 
Maybe just walk to the lake, maybe photographs. It's something people are bird watching, people are taking photos. Uh, they are all, also people with disabilities, it's critical. People in wheelchairs must be able to go to the parks and enjoy them, and people that are blind or people that have mental disabilities. So parks, the walking, the path, the chairs, but also being able to go to the park and paint. I mean, older arrows, let's facilitate the, 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 the use and the activities of the older arrows. I saw this in Gothenburg in Sweden, in the middle of a park near some buildings, they had this like a container and the container is open for the residents to go and work in carpentry. Once a week, someone that is really good, a handy person comes if, if someone have a big problem, but if not, they can just use it. They got all of the tools and then it's also a place for people to socialize. They had another container similar to this for knitting. No, no knitting, sorry, for sewing. So people go and fix their shirts or fix whatever they need. They had the machines, but also they talk, they socialize and they help. Imagine a container on a park where people can do these activities. Great, another programs. It's not only having the infrastructure or the activities, but we need to have programs, programs. They can be daily, weekly, monthly, see each season, but we need programs, 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 if we wanna get more, if we wanna increase the 4% of older adults in the parks to 20, that would be proportional or to 30 or more. We need to, for example, Shirin Joku. Shirin Joku, translates more or less into forest bathing. You can do it, anybody. Change joke is about spending time in the park. It's going to the park, but without music. It's not about running, no. Go to the park by yourself. Even if you go with someone else, tell them, okay, during the next 15 minutes, let's not talk to each other. Let's focus on the senses, looking at the trees, listening to the birds, feeling the wind, enjoying the moment, enjoying nature. And it's gonna be good for physical, but especially for mental health. That is so critical. But also there might be programs such as having bicycles where you people can take people that with either that are very dependent on trips around the park, inside the park, or doing Tai Chi or doing yoga. These activities, programs, programs. People will go to the park because sometimes people do the walking path and they say, oh, I see people walking. Yeah, you see the few that are walking. You don't see the many that are not. We need those activities for people because if people know that someone is there, uh, programs, programs. I was working in, I worked in many cities in Australia. This time was in Canberra and I saw these beautiful kangaroos. But one of the things that I love about this national park is that have night guided visits with some special lamps that don't hurt any of the animals, but it just helps you point out where they are. So it's programs that, that gets people to the parks. Urban gardening. It's inexpensive and it's fantastic because people come and they garden and they love the park and they develop a relationship and they're great stakeholders that people that, that, that have leash free dog areas, also good. Another message, walking to the park. Walking not only is the number one activity in the park, but every single trip to a park begins and ends by walking. So we need to make walking safe and enjoyable and it is not in most places. So we need to make it safe. And the reality is that inside parks, in the big ones, we shouldn't have any cars. And if by any reason you have to, they must go at the speed of the people walking, three to 10 miles an hour or less. And around the parks, what if all of the streets around parks, around in front of the neighborhood parks or the medium or all parks, quarter mile around the park radius, the maximum speed should be 20 miles an hour or less all of the roads. So you might be going on an arterial, it might be 40 miles an hour. As soon as you approach a park, within a quarter of a mile, it must go down to 20 miles an hour. They must realize that they might be older people crossing. They might be people that, 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 that have issues. As we get older, we lose a little bit of sight and hearing and walking speed and concentration. Also, sometimes we go with small children, with our grandchildren. So imagine if in front of all parks, the maximum speed limit should be 20 miles an hour or less, everywhere. That would be a huge win. Also for people, older adults that are gonna ride cycling or people that are gonna be on their tricycles, 
I mean, why 20 miles? Because if a car hits you at 20 miles an hour, there is 5% probability of being killed. At 40 miles is more than 80%. So we need to make that safe. It's something that is really critical. I mean, for example, on a crosswalk to the park, if there's a small island, you eliminate more than half of the incidents. Why are we doing crosswalk without an island? When we know that it's gonna be safe for the children, for moms and babies, but also for older adults that are, is the largest percent of population that gets killed in intersections, older adults. So we need the older adults to be able to go to the parks safely. We need to put people first. Sometimes it's just paint. Sometimes it's a little bit of infrastructure that is gonna get people safe, but we are not doing streets that are people first safe we get this, these cities and then we break them up to do highways or we do sidewalks. This is no, so imagine on a wheelchair, if you are, are or if you are blind or, or, or if you have other kinds of disabilities, so you are with a walker. This is a brand new sidewalk in the US, three years old. Nice that they put light on the sidewalk, not nice that they put it in the middle of the sidewalk. And in the same city, they did sidewalks on the, on, on the neighborhood inside small streets. Look at this, look like a roller coaster. Imagine on, with the walker or with the wheelchair, the sidewalks must be perfectly flat. So these are not really friendly and we need to change. It's not about doing infrastructure for the cars or for the dogs. We need infrastructures for people. Sometimes we don't even do sidewalks. It's like telling people you are a second class citizen. This, we need to stop this. By the way, sidewalks, when they said you gotta walk six feet apart, there was not even enough space. I mean, the sidewalks are so much like parks. The sidewalks, we develop a sense of belonging. We meet neighbors and so on. We use them in the summer, in the winter, children catch Pokemons on the sidewalks or public transit uh, and the grocery stores. I mean, the sidewalks in so many ways uh, teach us that walking is much more than walking. Uh, in Buenos Aires where people dance tango. Sidewalks are part of the family of the parks, but of course uh, it's not only about walking sustainable mobility. Sustainable mobility is also riding bicycles, using public transit, new uses of cars. So let's help older adults, grandchildren helping grandma, or in public transit going to the park, older people going with younger people, <clears throat> or be nice, take grandma on a ride. So three generations, look, three, four generations at the same time, this is magnificent. Another message, parks should be synonymous of health. Parks synonymous of health. Remember when we spoke about this, uh, I mentioned parks and recreation is good for physical health, but there is no health without mental health. Loneliness, loneliness is a huge problem. It increases 29% probability of heart disease, 32% stroke, twice the possibility of dementia, twice. Uh, the Surgeon General of the US says that loneliness is as severe as smoking 15 cigarettes every single day. Depression is the world leading cause of disability. If we have contact with nature, it's gonna improve our mood, our cognitive thinking, our depression. So we need to have contact with nature in the summer, in the winter, in Alaska or in Montgomery County, everywhere. If we have green neighborhoods, Green neighbor is gonna lower that depression, our anxiety, our stress. And this is an issue of equity because where rich people live, usually there are lots of parks and lots of trees. With the low income, no. So we gotta make this a top priority in building back better. Having trees and having parks in everywhere, especially let's put a priority lens to the low income areas. So this is green neighbors, it's completely doable. So let's work on this as a top priority. We need to have nature at home, on the sidewalk, on the school, on the place of work, and parks, park, parks at 10, 20, 30. Another message, let's volunteer and let's create friends of the parks groups. This is fantastic for everyone. So we gotta be able how to volunteer to organize activities in the parks. Uh, and we gotta bring people of all ages I saw this in Amherstburg, I saw these magnificent older people that volunteer doing gardening in the community parks. And it's, it's a win-win because everybody's happy. So, and when you do Friends of Parks, get people and organize Friends of Parks so that you participate in how to create them, but not just about older people. Please, when you create Friends of Parks, make sure that of course, Older adults are representative, but bring to the table different stakeholders so that there is a balance, either people that do sports or dog owners or people that do dance or do art or the local business, the area schools, 
faith groups. As many of them, at least five or more of them represented in the Friends of a Park. Volunteers, I was working in Arizona and I went to this magnificent desert botanical garden and they have 600 volunteers over 55 years old. This is fantastic for the people. Some volunteer two days or three or four, and they develop a sense of belonging. They develop a sense of purpose. They are being trained about specific areas. They're also being trained over giving guided tours. Uh, it would be impossible for the botanical garden to hire uh, 600 people. But so it's, it becomes a win-win for everyone. So let's do another message is parks are 365 days. Parks are not a summer infrastructure. People say cold. Uh, no, you know, parks and recreation are 365 days of the year. It's a four season activities. They said no such thing as bad weather is bad clothing. So let's get proper clothing and let's go walk and enjoy the parks. And of course there are extreme weathers hot in Arizona or cold in the winter. I know in Montgomery County, you got 15 horrible days per year. This little girl knows it, but you got 45 or so that are pretty cold, but you got over 200 that are really nice. So focus on the 200 nice days. And if you focus on the 200 nice days, even they're not so nice. So do programs and activities. Same thing in the summer, in the winter. Maybe in the winter, you gotta put a little more emphasis. When you do a movie night in the park, you gotta have better sound and better screen and have hot chocolate and popcorn and so on, and, and you can do it. But this is older people who wanna be outside and it's healthy. Here it is ice fishing. So, and sometimes the older people don't like in the winter is not so much the cold, but that is dark. So put lights, light, lights. These lights don't call them Christmas lights, call them winter lights and have them from November to March. Another message, almost last, parks, must be plus everything that is public. It must be interwoven with other activities. This is about sustainability. We talk sustainability, but then we don't mix uses. No, we need to interconnect parks and streets and schools and libraries and sidewalks and communities. Everything must be totally interconnected and you should be able to get information everywhere and help. This is great. The Trust for Public Land is doing across the US. This is in New York. Look how this so-called playground is really transforming into a magnificent park. So from a playground, a piece of pavement, they are turning into a school parks. The condition is that it is gonna be used for school during the school time, but it's gonna be open to the community in the evening, Saturdays, Sundays, and holidays. They are doing the same thing now. This one is in Philadelphia. This one is in the Bronx. Look at this, magnificent. It's totally dual. Instead of having cars parked, now you have people. So all the adults need to enjoy this. I was working in Charlotte and I went to a retirement home in Southminster. In front of it, they had a high school. They were not allowed even to use the outdoor facilities that was across the street. It didn't make any sense. So we organized a lunch. In each table, there were four people from the retirement home and four students from the high school students. And it was, they learned from each other so much. It was a, a very enjoyable experience. Afterwards, they, they, they started sharing not only the facilities at the school, but also learning from each other. This same sound means to look at this beautiful facility. They built the size of a basketball court. Half of it has equipment for children. The other half is equipment for older people. And then they have a walking path around it. You see what I mentioned? It doesn't have to be gigantic. This might be the size of a basketball court or one and a half basketball courts and is wonderful for everybody. So or let's take over the streets. The streets are 30% of our cities. Let's create play streets so that we can even go and dance in the middle of the streets. All the people, let's become advocates for parks. Let's be generous. For example, let's become advocates for parks for children zero to four, because many planners think that children are born five years old. You go to the parks and there's an area for five to 12 or 12 to 18. There is nothing from zero to four. I mean, let's think about it. You could experience the city and the parks from 95 centimeters. That is the height of a three-year-old. What would you change? What would you change? So let's work on that. Imagine the older adults became uh, generous and, and became advocates of these future city leaders. I mean, we can become advocates of, how about sidewalks? Older adults becoming campaign on sidewalks, at least around the parks and within quarter of a mile around every park. That would be fantastic. Maybe all of us would end up dancing tango on the sidewalks. And the last message is the fourth generation park. This is incredible. 
Now we see very often to see three and four generations and soon even five generations together. And I love it maybe because now I have a grandchild and I love him so much and I enjoy going to the parks. But here I was with my mom and my, our children and grandchildren, four generations in nature. Four generations is becoming more and more common and it's really priceless to be in the parks. So we got to focus on this. And for example, whenever we do a playground in a park, let's make sure in next to the playground, there is a nice cozy place for grandparents because the magic of the grandparent bringing the grandchild to the park. But if there's no place to sit, it's going to get bored in 10 minutes and want to go home. But if there's a nice cozy place to sit, and chat and socialize. It's gonna be a win-win. The, the, the zero to four or the, or the eight or the 10 or the 12 is gonna be very happy, but also the grandparent is gonna be very, very happy. But also it, it, having possibilities to play. So let's not forget about the multi-generational magic on the parks. Every single playground, as important as having a swing, is having the place for grandparents to sit and have a coffee and look at the grandchild. So benches, benches, benches. All of this is really interrelated. Four generations enjoying nature and each other. So I wanna conclude by saying that post-COVID is about health, equity, and sustainability. There is not gonna be a Martian coming down to say, oh, I'm gonna create great parks and park system for older adults so that older adults will live healthier and happier in Montgomery County. No, we must plan the cities and the parks radically different. We must manage the cities and parks different. These are not technical issues. These are not financial issues. This is about policy, but not a political issue. There's no political party. Everything that I have spoken should be of interest to Democrats and Republicans and independents and non-political. This is about older people living longer, healthier, and happier. So this is like a big P. Everybody needs to participate. Let's develop a shared vision of the parks and park system for older adults and action, action, action. We need lots of action. And then older adults and parks we're gonna remember, we need to fight ageism and we need to tell people ageism is dumb. And we need to tell people as part of this purpose, older adults are givers, not takers. Older adults are assets to the parks community. Let's become advocates of the parks community. Older adults, we need to develop purpose. The purpose is gonna help us live longer, healthier and happier. So what if the purpose is, is some of these issues? Older adults, let's contribute to create great parks and great programs, but also citywide park systems. And keep in mind, if it's great for older adults, it's gonna be great for people zero to over a hundred. So let's work on the shared vision, lots of action, and we're gonna live longer, healthier, and happier. Thank you very much. Well, Gil, I, I, this, you, you knocked it out of the ballpark, and I tell you, if you want to get your batteries charged, just listen to you for an hour, and that certainly incentivizes, certainly me and I think everybody that's on this talk, to, to get out there and, and start uh, instituting those 12 steps, to, and, and I think the 12 steps that you went through are a fantastic roadmap to getting our over 60 population actually out there in parks, and um, and I know certainly I'm going to be one of those soon, so I, I have to take heed. A couple of takeaways, you know, when we look at COVID, and, and I'm glad you brought that up, you know, you, you try to find silver linings in everything, right? And, and I think with COVID has created, like you said, incredible opportunities um, that we've instituted very, very quickly. You know, taking the streets where people were driving cars all the time to pedestrian walkways and bikeways. And I think that's phenomenal. Um, you know, the five actions to well-being. I think that's something else that we really need to take a look at. Eating plant-based foods, um, sleeping seven to eight hours. I know that's something that we don't do a lot of um, that helps you remember things. Um, one of the big takeaways I got from that was two, two would be physically active in contact with nature, I think is critical. Uh, so I think that, you know, those are some, some great things. We have a, um, a, an opportunity now for folks to step up and ask questions. And I know Hu Zhang, who is my assistant here, is going to put up some questions that I think folks have. Um, so here's a, here's a short question about um, bikes and electric bikes. It can often create conflict with walkers 
and, and more passive activities on trails, how can you create a balance between the bikes and the e-bike population with the folks that are doing the more passive walking in, in our parks? Well, that, 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 that's a very important question because now there are more and more e-assisted bikes and electric assisted bikes are fantastic, especially for older adults. Uh, the other day I was with a friend in, in, in Copenhagen and his wife had an e-bike and I said, why? And then she said, oh, because she had a hip surgery and now she could not bike as well. So she had the e-assisted bike. Also, some people live in communities with hills, so it helps also for longer distance, but we must regulate the bicycles. First, not only e-bikes, but regular bicycles, like on trails. We cannot mix people walking and people cycling when there is a lot of people. When there is a lot of people, we cannot do multi-purpose trails. Multi-purpose multi works when you are way out in a suburb, like in, in Montgomery County, you have a lot of rural areas. In rural areas with low density, you can have multi-purpose. As soon as they start coming into more urbanized area, when there is more people, you need to separate the pedestrians and the cyclists because the people walking walk at three miles an hour. The people cycling bike at 12 to 18 miles an hour. So when you mix them, it becomes dangerous. For example, children, they don't walk in a straight line. They walk from side to side. You know, many older people don't hear well. So people are walking and all of a sudden a bicycle shows up and then they get scared. They might not tell their parks department, but they stop coming because they, they're gonna be scared. So anytime that, 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 it be, that, that you get close to urban areas, on the peak day, don't, don't think of Monday during work hours. No, if the peak day is Monday, Monday. But if the peak day is Saturday or Sunday, at the peak time, if there is a lot of people walking and cycling, you need separate, don't, don't mix. And then, and then of course, also the e-bikes, they must be not mo electric motorcycles, but really bicycles that the e-assisted, it helps with it and has to have a top speed of maybe 20 miles an hour. So that also you, you don't want mixing bicycles with uh, electric motorcycles at 40 or 50 miles an hour. So, 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 so that I, I think it's a welcome addition to older adults to have e-assisted bikes, but we should not mix with people walking because it's not a win-win. <coughs> Great, no, I really appreciate that. I think, and there was another question that sort of had something to do with that. You know, it's, it's the, the biking and wheelchair conflicts that may occur, and it certainly does occur with pedestrians. So I think you hit it, you, you've nailed it really well with that. We just need to be cognizant as we, as we get into the design of these spaces. And I certainly do appreciate the you know, I, I was educated when you talked about the, the amount of pedestrians that get hit in walkways uh, and they're being active older adults and having islands in those walkways, that's a, that's a big contributor to not getting hit in those, in those, as people cross those areas, which is really neat. Now, I got another question here. Um, this person says, during the, during the COVID, some people explored new lifestyles using parks and trails, which, which, which they didn't do before COVID. So people are discovering parks now. I think that's one of the things across the nation people are figuring out, wow, there's a park just in my backyard. And you, how do you think we can help them keep their active lifestyle that they picked up during COVID? So I guess the fear is, you know, we've, we've, we've allowed people to discover parks. We've created all these mechanisms to get into parks. Uh, but, but the big fear or the big challenge might be is how do we continue that to make sure that we keep those folks engaged and not, and so they don't digress back into their old lifestyle. Yeah, well, one thing is COVID was horrible. Way too many people have died all over the world and they're continuing to die every day, today, tomorrow. So I'm not gonna say it, it was horrible. One good thing about COVID is that it brought out people mental health, for example. Before COVID, people were very hesitant to talk about mental health. People thought people with mental health issues, they should be in hospitals. So people were very concerned, they wouldn't even speak about it. Now, everybody's talking openly about mental health because everybody has been impacted. And if not directly, someone firsthand, their parents, their children, their spouses, and people also have realized that parks are good for mental health, that, 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 that the nature is good for mental health. So this is something that we 
must, must embrace and promote. For example, people, older adults are very concerned about dementia. By far, the number one action for dementia is to be physically active. By you, you listen to doctors, and I've been reading and reading a lot about this. It's almost unanimous that there is nothing as good for, to fight dementia or to postpone it as much as possible than physical activity. Where are we going to do physical activity? In parks. So we start adding that physical activity is by far the best. And that contact with nature is also good. So if you do the physical activity, but you do it in nature, it's going to be much better than if you do the same physical activity, but inside a gym. So let's talk to people about that, about the, pro, uh, uh, about the benefits, the benefits to mental health, the benefits to physical health, the benefit to the environment, and also that is free, it's inexpensive, and everybody can meet. So, so all of this, thing. and also parks and recreation must provide programs, because people, like one of the activities that is taking off in the States a lot is knitting in the park. Knitting, of course, people could be knitting at home, why do they go to the park? Because they wanna be with other people. They wanna socialize. And not only women, it used to be that knitting was something that older women, mostly white would do. Now, everybody, all races, all ethnicities, and not only older people. Now also you see younger people doing knitting in the parks. So this is great, but we need to have the groups uh, and, and that is gonna be something that we are gonna get. Through programs, we're gonna get people in, into the park and we need to stay. We, we, can, we need to keep in mind, great parks are great is if people visit, they stay and they come back. So we need to work on that coming back and staying so that this was not just during COVID. So that people will remember that during COVID, this past winter, people were in the parks in the middle of the winter. I mean, you put on a nice jacket and a pair of boots and you're gonna be able to walk and you're gonna be able to enjoy it. And then you come home and you have a nice hot chocolate. So, so, so I think that a little bit working on the two issues, the benefits, but also the programs, we're gonna be able to get to it. Oh, and one last thing, when go the government says build back better, there's lots and lots and lots of money, tons of money for very few things and almost nothing for most. Usually in the past, whenever there was an economic crisis like in 2008, in all economic crises, the, one of the first things that cities and states and the federal government cuts is parks. They cut the budget of parks and recreation. I hope that now that people have realized that parks is not only to have fun and games, which is very, very important to have fun and to have games, but it's also good for physical and mental health and the environment and climate change, that parks are gonna be put on the pile of few things with lots of money and not on the big pile with lots of things, but with no money. You know, this really ties into to a little bit about what Jennifer talked about in the 38 million members that are currently the AARP members strong and, and tying those folks into that organization with parks and recreation agencies, I think would be a great benefit because they are a, a wonderful sounding board. Um, I have another question. So someone, someone talked about schools and you had a lot of slides on schools and I was really impressed because some of the transformation of schools in the parks was amazing. But um, this person said, any recommendations on how to encourage schools participation to create healthy lifestyles. Have you seen that around the country and, and through your travels, what schools are doing? Yeah, this is very important because we talk about sustainability, but then we go and do a library who doesn't even know what parks and recreation is. And we do a school, same thing. And, we, and then we do the parks and they don't even talk to each other. Uh, no, we need to, everything that is public needs to be totally in sync. So even in libraries, we need to do around the library in, in the grounds. Uh, urban gardening and have children's game and older adults. Older adults should be able to go and do other activities. The schools, we have magnificent schools. Montgomery County has one of the best school systems in North America. Uh, however, the schools are shut for the community. No, they need to open up to the community. Sometimes they come up with a ridiculous excuse, liability. No, liability, that's just an excuse. You know, some people are looking for problems to solutions. So then they say liability. Others are looking for solutions to problems. So they find how to go around the liability and solve that issue. But we, we, 
you know, the same community who, who built the school, the whole community, it was through taxes, but there might be a school board or there might be a city and a county and a state, but nevertheless, it's the same taxpayer, the same person. So it doesn't make any sense that sometimes I go to some cities in the US and I talk to the school board and they say, oh, it's not up to me. And then I talk to the principal and say, it's not up to me, it's up to the custodian. What? We put $15 million building a school and then let a custodian decide if the community can use it or not. Uh, no, we, we need to work on that because also even in those 15 horrible days a year of the winter, we can get people going into the schools and just walking around the hallways. Let's shut the classrooms. But also in those bad days, we could have even in the high school, some classrooms open so that at the end of the class, the students put everything in, 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 in closets with doors, but people can come at night and play cards or domino or, or chat or socialize or whatever whatever, those belongs to the community. The schools need to be community hubs. Fortunately, more and more schools in the US are starting to do this. Uh, I, I think Trust for Public Land, tpl.org is, is a great source because they've been working with, with communities. The images that I show, those fantastic transformation were, were through Trust for Public Land that they have done over 200 schools in, in the state of New York and they are doing in many other places. So, but we need to develop th th those kind of partnerships. I also show the example in Shardor, how this residents, old, older people residents, live, living in front of a high schools and they were not even allowed to use the facilities. This, this is totally craziness. So we need to be much more efficient. And, and when we, when I say the post cover has to be about equitable and sustainable communities, using school facilities hits both equity and sustainability. Right. Well, Gil and Jennifer, thank you so much. This has been enlightening and I've learned an awful lot and I've been in the field for 30 years. So every time I listen to you, I get more and more knowledge in my head. So I want to thank you folks for spending time with us today, uh, encouraging us to find that silver lining, to make changes in our parks. Uh, Jennifer, your encouraging words to get more of the active older adult folks out into the parks. I certainly is, is a huge lift for us. So any closing remarks you either, either one of you want to make? Well, I just want to say that, thank Jennifer. I think that AARP is a magnificent organization. Imagine 38 million paid members across the US. Imagine if all of the southern the parks department everywhere develop a strong partnership. Imagine these 38 million members asking their local, state, and federal representatives, their elected officials, to put money into parks, to fund that is not only hardware, but it is also software. And that is, so the older adults have a huge capacity of influence. We need to develop is, is that, that sense of purpose, that benefit. So, and, and I think the program of livable communities of ARP is something that really works. Also, because this is a process, you, are, you never end. You have to go through some steps and at the end of five years, you are actually accepted in the group. And this is a nice club with cities from all over the US and all over the world where everybody learns from each other and how to be better and better. So I wanna thank Jennifer and everyone at AARP for the amazing work that they do with live all communities and invite anybody related to parks to develop that link, that partnership, because it's a win-win. At the end of the day, it's great for everyone. And let's great. keep in mind that all the others we must live healthier and happier. Hey, Jennifer, closing remarks for you. Yeah, absolutely. And thank you, Gil. You've been a wonderful partner for the organization as a whole and for me personally. So I, I thank you again. I would just encourage everyone here to take a look at AARP's Livable Communities pages. Um, I did put one of them in the chat feature. But uh, frankly, AARP has done such extensive work on uh, uh, creating um, collections of design examples and toolkits that you can use locally. But Gil, you're absolutely right. We are only as good as our membership and as the partnerships that we create in the community. So work with your state offices um, wherever you are today uh, with AARP and become an advocate. Um, that's how you really get things done working with local officials, working with local nonprofits, and really pushing this initiative forward to make sure that parks, trails, and other aspects of livability design are, are you know, carried out in your community. Thank you, guys. Great. Well, By thank way, you very John, much. 20% yes. of the population in Montgomery County are Hispanic. 
And in the website that Jennifer put in, there is lots of documents in English, but also almost all of them are translated into Spanish. And they, all of them are free. So you can download them or request them by mail. And they are really good uh, on walkability or bikeability or uh, housing or, or orcas, including parks. Uh, so that, that's a great free resource for anybody. Great. Well, again, we want to thank you from Montgomery Parks. You guys have been amazing. And um, we're signing off. Have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.